An economy on the rebound with unemployment falling, state tax revenues increasing, but thousands of unfilled jobs across the state. We take the economic pulse of Iowa on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating nearly 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, July 2 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. At the halfway point of 2021, the economic situation in Iowa is a top focus for government and business leaders. State tax revenues are on the upswing as overall unemployment figures are decreasing. But thousands of Iowa businesses are searching for workers as the overall workforce shifts to a post-pandemic reality. Well, to gather some economic insight, we gathered a pair of Iowa experts. Peter Arazam is economics professor at Iowa State University, and Bill Bowl is professor of economics at Drake University. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us. Across the table is Lynn Ta, Des Moines reporter for Axios, and Kay Henderson is news director at Radio Iowa. Bill Bowl, I'll start with you. This Friday, jobs report out. What did the tea leaves show you? Well, hiring is up, and yet unemployment is uh, unchanged, and labor force participation is unchanged. So it seems like there are still lots of people sitting on the sides not looking for work. Peter Arazam, do you see the same thing? Well, what's interesting is that people are going from out of the labor force directly into employment as opposed to having to search for jobs. And so it looks like you have a relatively large number of people who are considered out of the labor force, but still, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, want a job. Uh, what's different is they're not actively searching for jobs, but when they start searching, they're able to find them very quickly. Um, Peter Arazam, in regards to the state policy that changed um, about um, a month ago, nearly a month ago, the governor said we're going to get rid of this federal addendum, the extra $300 that unemployed Iowans were getting. Do we yet know what impact that has had since it went away? We know that the, this is the largest increase, monthly increase in employment that we've had in many, many. In uh, Iowa? Uh, no, we don't know in Iowa yet. Okay. The Iowa numbers are going to come out in mid-July. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that about half the states have decided to forego the $300 supplement to the unemployment benefit. Uh, one assumes that that would uh, increase incentives to, to take jobs it's consistent with a sudden surge in, in, in employment growth nationally, but we don't know where that growth is geographically yet. We'll know in two weeks. Bill Ball, do you have that assumption? Yes, but we do know that there are some people who are ineligible for uh, uh, unemployment benefits that who are, actually Peter has pointed this out before, that who are out of the labor force, meaning they're not searching. And if you're not searching, you can't get benefits. So there's a lot of those people too. Bill Bull, we started 2020 with strong participation rate here in Iowa, but over the pandemic, we saw an abnormally high amount of people exit the workforce. Who are they and where are they? I, I don't know who they are, but you're absolutely right. It's been striking, uh, even more striking, I think, than the national numbers. There's been a big increase and it hasn't really changed. There are still a lot of people uh, out of the labor force who were in the labor force a year ago. Yeah. 
And Peter Erasm, your thoughts? Well, it, you would think maybe it's related to the fact that we're a relatively low-wage state, and so a $300 supplement to the unemployment benefit will go farther in Iowa than it would in New York City. But South Dakota has not experienced the same shortfall in labor force participation Nebraska has. And so you get these really strange patterns state by state in terms of the drop-off of labor force participation. Iowa is relatively unusual in how large the reduction in labor force participation was, mm -hmm. given the relatively smaller employment loss uh, in Iowa. Uh, and kind of considering that, I mean, do you think that Iowa is an attractive place for, for young people to come here and work here and live here? We'll start with you, Bill Bull. Oh, well, I think so, but uh, not uniformly. I think uh, the cities uh, are attractive. That's my impression from talking to my own students. Um, other parts of Iowa, perhaps a little bit less, I would say. Yeah. If you look at where the job losses have been least in Iowa, it's Des Moines at, at just a little over 2% job loss uh, compared to a little over 4% nationally. If you look at some of the smaller metros, they've actually been hit a lot harder. And so Des Moines looks relatively attractive. The smaller metro areas don't look quite as good. What about the, let me follow up on Lynn's question. Uh, Peter Razum, both of you, you both work on a campus, talk to young people. Uh, the business community is worried that we are uh, not an attractive place because of hostile activities taken by politicians. Some of the anti-gay uh, rhetoric that comes from some politicians, um, uh, the racial climate in the state. Uh, what do you think? Do you think Iowa is uh, turning off, and I'll start with you, Bill Bo, I mean, uh, do you think Iowa is turning off young people to this state with some of this activity? Well, you know, I, I actually am involved with recruiting faculty, and uh, we have a lot to brag about in Iowa, but that is a, a concern. Uh, faculty members, uh, my colleagues who are minority, even who are Jews, have told me that there are parts of Iowa where they've encountered hostile comments. and. Uh, that is a, that, that's a, a negative. Peter? Well, there are the things that make us attractive are relatively low costs of housing and relatively low cost of living. Um, pay isn't as strong in Iowa as it is elsewhere, and we don't have the very large metro areas that, that a lot of young people find more attractive. Uh, I'm not sure that it's, it's very easy to know how um, uh, the, the politics of Iowa matters for, for people who are looking for work. I mean, we've had uh, trouble uh, keeping young people in Iowa long before we had problems with, uh, with uh, a more polarized uh, political climate. And you find polarized political climates pretty much everywhere uh, in the United States. And so uh, I think uh, there's a lot of reasons why we would like to, to return to a more uh, uh, civilized discourse <laughs> uh, in, in, in politics, but I don't think that, that it's going to change the incentives for a young person to stay in Iowa. Bill Bull, also news this week that the state of Iowa ended the fiscal year with about half a billion dollars of surplus. Um, Governor Reynolds in the middle of June, as she was signing a bill that cut a variety of taxes, said she'll be back next year asking for additional cuts in Iowa's personal income tax. How would that impact the state's economy? Well, uh, it's, it's surprising actually that uh, state and local governments throughout the pandemic, their revenues have held up pretty well, more than I would have expected, except for the second quarter of last year, you know, when the pandemic was in its worst. Um, so, uh, I would guess that a, a change in the income tax rate will not have a huge effect, but um, it is heartening to know that, uh, that there's plenty of money. So if Iowa got rid of the personal income tax, which is something that's a goal of uh, some Republican uh, legislators, how would that impact the labor market? Would it impact population shifts? Uh, it might attract a few people uh, who would like to be in a state where they wasn't taxed, but of course they'd probably have to raise the sales tax a little bit. So, well, Peter Arazam, how how much would you have to raise the sales tax if you get rid of the income tax? Well, you'd have to raise it 
substantially. Uh, my own experience is that the, the uh, doing work on firm entry in Iowa compared to other places is the property tax rates are, are, are much more serious. I mean, if you're starting up a business, you may not have any income and you may not have any sales, but you're going to have property and you have to pay that tax right up front. So putting more burden on the least competitive tax structures in Iowa, I don't think the income tax is particularly unattractive in Iowa, is probably counterproductive. So, so you think it would be better, excuse me, Ken, you think it would be better to focus on lowering property taxes than going to a, an 11 or 12 percent sales tax? I think an, uh, 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 an increased sales tax that would place less burden on property taxes would make a lot of sense. I think that uh, some of the, the tax policies that prevent local governments from uh, adjusting their tax rates would make uh, a lot of sense to try to remove those constraints. I mean, you look at Lincoln, Nebraska that paid for uh, all this public entertainment space with an entertainment tax, and we're not allowed to have an entertainment tax in Iowa. I think that we've sort of made way too many restrictions on how local governments fund themselves and put too much burden then on the state support for those uh, local efforts. And, and that's one of the reasons why we have a relatively um, uh, uncompetitive tax structure overall. So what's your guess, uh, Peter Rosam, what happens when um, the state scales back and ultimately ends the payments it was making to local governments to replace lost commercial say, uh, property tax revenue. What happens then? Well, there are two things. You're going to have uh, the, the quality of local services suffer because most of the urban areas, most of the metro areas that are the places that are the most attractive for bringing people in Iowa are already capped in terms of what their property tax rates can be. And so you're going to have uh, a reduction in the quality of those services. The places that can still raise tax rates are obviously going to likely uh, have to put more pressure on, on property taxes. And as I said, if you compare Iowa to its neighbors, it's our property tax rates that are the most destructive in terms of, say, looking at which side of a border uh, new firms enter. And in addition to being an economist, you spent, what, 10 years as a member of the Ames City Council? Oh, eight years, <laughs> but uh, it seemed like 10. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Bill Bull, we'll move to you. Uh, more public and private agencies are investing in cybersecurity insurance, uh, but we're also seeing a high rise in these rates, some of them by 50%. You know, what does this mean just for the everyday consumer when we're dealing with these higher prices uh, for these very 2021 issues? Oh, that's higher costs, and that's going to get passed through into prices for sure. Yeah. There's no, no getting around that. Yeah. Especially for municipalities um, that are investing in these insurance, uh, these different insurances, and are having to deal with these higher rates, um, you know, what do you think that may mean for residents? Well, I mean, that's uh, something has got to give. So, fewer services or more fees or taxes and things like that. Yeah. Um, in two thousand one, uh, after the terrorist attack, um, Iowa's insurance industry made an appeal. Uh, to federal officials because they said they couldn't cover, um, you know, terrorism. Is, is a Bill Bull, in your view, um, there a larger role for the federal government in this cybersecurity area and picking up the cost that businesses bear rather than shifting it to the insurance industry? Well, I think there's a role for the federal government in uh, sort of research and pr promotion of best practices and so forth. but. Uh, I don't think it makes sense for them to pick up the, the cost beyond that. Um, Peter Razum, there's, um, as David Yepsen likes to say, a lot of federal pandemic money sloshing around in state and local governments. What happens? Is there a cliff ahead in the economy when all of that gets spent? Well, what's interesting is that, uh, for example, look at sort of relatively massive uh, income transfer payments that occurred over the last uh, 16 months. A lot of it was saved. And, and if people can't figure out what to do with that money, they sat on it. Now, you're going to see some of that reentering the labor market, but I think that what's, what's actually happened is a lot of this money hasn't really been spent. It's sort of sitting on the sidelines. 
what you hope is that it's not going to all enter the, the, the marketplace at once and you're going to get this very large surge in, in, in customer demand or consumer demand because that's going to have upward pressure on prices. Uh, I think that actually uh, people use that, those resources to, to basically uh, insure themselves against potential future shocks and, and a lot less of it actually ended up in the, in the marketplace. So, Bill Bull, what's the answer here for um, someone who is an individual, got the stimulus check? I mean, Americans usually spend stuff. We're a consumption society. Um, have we gotten to sort of a demarcation point where we may start saving more? Well, I think there's a big split. I mean, some people lost their jobs in the pandemic, and so they spent the money pretty quickly. But the people who didn't lose their jobs um, didn't have opportunities for travel and things like that, so they saved it. Now, we're seeing some of this money flow into the real estate market, where prices nationally are going up at around uh, 12, 13, 14 percent a year, although in Iowa it's only, I think, about six or something like that. So that's, that's one place the money is going, I think. So, Bill Bull, as a, an economist, when you look at the pandemic, what is the thing that you want to research the most? As, a, as an economist, when you, what's, what, what intrigues you the most from, you know, from a 30,000-foot perspective? Well, the labor market is, is surely the most peculiar thing we've ever seen in my lifetime. And uh, I'd like to know uh, what happened. Uh, did people just stop looking for work? Did they, why, why were there so many people sitting on the sideline all of a sudden? Could it be that we've changed our attitudes to life? Uh, not just work, but everything. The pandemic um, made us all aware life is precious, life is short. Many people lost uh, friends. We've had tens of thousands of people die. Um, that. Uh, you know, I'm not just going to race out and get any old job anymore. I'm going to think about this. I mean, people, th this condo collapse in Florida, uh, talk about abrupt. And, and I think, what, do you think it's had an effect on people psychologically that I'm not going to race right back out and, and start working again? I'm going to take it easy and enjoy life a little more? Well, both, I'd like to hear from both of you on this. I think that there's another side to this. The University of Chicago economists looked at uh, what happened to incomes for people who lost their jobs versus those who retained their jobs in the first uh, eight months uh, of the pandemic. The people who lost their jobs actually did better than the people who retain their jobs holding constant previous earnings, right? So you take people who had exactly the same pay before the pandemic, some lost their jobs and they qualified for unemployment benefits. With the supplement, their incomes actually went up. The people who retained their jobs, their incomes didn't go up much. They, there were some repayment bonuses or you know, wage bonuses that were paid. But literally, losing your job in the pandemic actually, on average, increased your income. And I think that has an effect on your incentives to, uh, uh, to take a job. Savings for the people who lost their jobs also increased more than the savings for people who retained their work and would have only gotten the $1,200 supplement. Well, same question. Have people changed their attitudes toward work here? You're well, both labor economists, so it's a... I, uh, well, I think your question is uh, quality of, of jobs, and I don't really know the answer to that, but there was a, a survey f uh, done by the New York Fed uh, recently that showed that the wage expectations have gone up in the last, uh, say, six months, maybe eight months, uh, especially for people, it turns out, who uh, do not have a college degree. And these are people who have been losing ground for quite a while. So are we in a post-minimum wage period? Well, we're in a period where the minimum wage affects hardly anybody, uh, at, at least uh, in Iowa and uh, for much of the country, uh, the federal minimum wage at least. Peter Arazam, I mean, we're seeing people get paid $15, um, in some instances $30, just to get somebody at a position in a restaurant or... Uh, the wage uh, increases, uh, the pace of wage increases in the U.S. over the last 16 months is the highest in the last 20 years. And so clearly, 
uh, the, the returns to being in the labor market have improved. And I suspect that we're going to see that uh, a surge in, in the number of people who are interested in taking uh, advantage of that over the next few, uh, few months. So given all the e economic data you have at present, does this compare with anything before? This will be the strangest recession we've ever had. Uh, we're expected to, within two years of the initiation of the recession to return to the unemployment rates that we had at the beginning. And we had very strong labor market as of February of 2020. Um, uh, you had a sudden spike in unemployment rates, the highest spike in unemployment rates over a very short period of time in March and April of 2020, and then the sharpest decline in unemployment rates immediately thereafter. Uh, remember, it took us seven years to return to the, the pre-recession unemployment rates in the Great Recession. We're going to be, at current projections, uh, back to our previous unemployment rates within, within 30 months of, those, of the start of the recession. Um, Bill Bull, I mean, we're talking about these rising wages. What does this mean for the everyday Iowa consumer then? Well, uh, I think uh, it means that the wages paid uh, to people who are, don't have college degrees, who might be, I imagine, in retail and things like that, it means that the price, uh, those costs will get passed through to consumers. Yeah. And, and Peter Arazum, your thoughts? Yes, I think we're going to see, at least for the near term, a surge in inflation. We've already seen it. The question is, how long is it going to last? How long do you think it's going to last? If you look at wage expectations, remember that's how we had uh, the stagflations of the, of the 1970s. Uh, obviously, the Fed is, I think, privately nervous, if they're not publicly nervous, about whether or not uh, expected inflation is going to get passed through into wage expectations, and then you get a cycle of, of long-term inflation. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so one of the, the solutions um, to kind of all of this, President Biden and Democrats have talked about um, really having strong labor unions. What do you think is the future of labor unions here in the U.S. and specifically here in Iowa? We'll start with you, Peter Arazan. Well, let's let Bill. He's a, a union uh, expert, so he, that's, that's his area of research. So, Well, I, I don't think there's much political support for that, so I don't see that coming. Uh, if, in fact, uh, the fraction of workers that, um, that are members of, the, of unions has held roughly constant through the pandemic, but that was mostly because um, there was uh, less of a decline in union jobs than there were in other jobs. Uh, so I, I don't think uh, unions are, are, despite the figures, I don't think they're making much progress. Yeah. Do, do you think it would make a difference, though, if the, the labor unions were stronger here in Iowa with some of these issues that we're talking about and attracting workers? Uh, hard to say. Um, uh, it, my, Hard for me to say, yeah. really. I'm not sure. Do you think, um, I'll start with you, Bill Bull. This has, some of this has to do with the respect paid to uh, workers and the attractiveness of the jobs. Um, everything, for years, we've, everyone has to go to college and uh, get a degree. And, uh, and now we're discovering that uh, you know, there's a lot of money to be made as a plumber in San Francisco, for example. Uh, Six-figure income. Do we need to look, think about the dignity of work a little bit more? Well, I'm, I'm sure that's what uh, workers are, are looking for in addition to higher pay. You well, know. yeah, dear workers are, are quoted in the paper saying, you know, and they, they're the best paid blue collar workers in the state, that they don't like this, some of this the business of laying off people in a seasonal basis. They'd rather, again, the dignity of work, a full-time job. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I, I'm sure that there's a demand for that too, yeah. Peter? Well, you know, at the end of the day, um, people need to be able to make enough money to, to, to have a livelihood. And, and I think that's what dignity really means, is, is being able to, to, to raise your family and, and, and to do work that you find meaningful. Uh, I don't think that's changed any. And, and to be honest, I'm not sure, you know, if you have your, your uh, six-figure uh, income as a plumber. Remember, a plumber is a very skilled worker, and 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 so I, I think that 
the average education in the United States is now 14 and a half years, right? It's more than an associate's degree. We're a very skill-intensive economy, and I think that uh, it's, it's, it, that's, those skills make you much more mobile. If the firm isn't going to treat you well, uh, you're going to leave. The quit rates in the United States have really skyrocketed in the last three months, and one suspects it's related to how well they feel they're being treated at their current companies. Just about 10 seconds left. Is Iowa destined to be a warehouse um, mecca? I think that transportation is, is a solid. I think that, that we're likely to have uh, an increase in, in warehousing, wholesale, re uh, and, and transportation, yes. And I have to call a halt. We're out of time, gentlemen. Thank you both for, for being with us today. Pleasure. Thank you. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Iowa Press at our regular times, 7.30 Friday night and noon on Sunday. For all of us here at Iowa PBS, I'm David Yepsen. Thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.